agricultural growing areas changing. It's a question that I won't steal his thunder, but he'll be speaking about the chemistry that changes uh, on the planet. We have to take the year 2100 seriously. And I want you to remember, you forget everything I say, I want you to always say to your friends, 2100 matters to my baby or to my cousin's baby. You want to have more babies in Korea? Don't forget 2100. Okay. Now, one of the things that's important is that we're in the process of merging our minds and machines for greater efficiency. We can do this for good or for ill, as the Secretary General just told you. If we do it for good, then the efficiencies of energy use and the efficiencies of civilization and wealth creation will be far, far more than it is today. That's a good sign. But it also means, as the Secretary General said, we have to work on artificial intelligence and new technology in a smart way. But the idea of our merger and our experience getting interconnected seems to be inevitable, which means today we value a lot of things. You got to give a birthday present to some other thing. You got to give a child a thing. We have things and things and things and things. We're killing ourselves with things, right? But if we have experiences, then it doesn't matter. You can have more experience with less environmental impact. So that's one of the directions I think we should start to go in. Next, changing the energy base of the world is hard to do tomorrow morning. But you can change how you eat tomorrow morning. There was an FAO study, very controversial, but you can do a Google search on this, Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, the United Nations. Did a study back in 2006 it says that more greenhouse gases come from cars, I'm sorry, from cow industry, the meat industry, than come from cars. Now we have a lot of attention being spent on hybrid cars. I have a little hybrid car myself, so I'm doing my two bits as well. I don't drive to work, I work at home, I do all that. But one of the fastest ways to have an impact is changing how you eat. That you can do. You don't have to ask the politician to do. You don't have to ask the corporation to do. You can do that yourself. Now, right now, uh, we've got plant-based meat substitutes that are growing very well in the stock market. Thank you very much. One of the fastest growth of the stock market in the United States is on this. Next will be coming up when you make the genetic material directly. So the second one there is real meat. It's not fake meat. It's not synthetic meat. It's real meat. It comes from real genetic material that makes meat. You just don't make the whole cow. You just make the meat. It's pure, pure meat. That will have even less environmental impact. Also, you get return on investment the next day. The plant stuff, you still have to plant it, you have to harvest it, you have to water it, you have to do a lot of stuff. So these, this direction is a direction each one of you, if you believe in all this stuff, can act on tomorrow morning. Another area that's not been explored well is the coastlines of the world can produce the next round of food for the world and the next round of energy for the world as well. We can imagine a coastline, say this is the land and this water over here, I can put cut channels and I can irrigate with salt water. There's a lot of things that can grow in salt water and with genetic engineering even more can grow in salt water. We can produce food, fish, algae, algae for cosmetics, algae for energy, algae for all kinds of further stuff. And we can also produce materials for paper. We don't want to keep cutting down trees and make paper, so we can do it along the coastlines of the world. Saltwater agriculture is very important for the following reasons. One, it's a carbon sink. You're taking a brown area and you're making it green. All right, that's absorbing CO2. Now, because of cap and trade, such investments can be paid for to reduce the risk of the investment. Two, you're reducing the demand on fresh water on the planet by moving some of your agriculture over to salt water. Three, it solves the number one agricultural problem in history. Rain. We don't need rain. We don't care if there's a drought. Matter of fact, you're happy not to have any rain. That's a big deal for farmers to solve that problem. So this is another area that 
You can't do it tomorrow morning, but you can do it sooner than changing the energy base of the world. We still want to change the energy base of the world, but I just want to stress these two things. These are things that can happen much faster than some of the uh, longer term solutions. Now, Secretary General talked about smart cities. That's obviously very, very important. I would add to it eco smart cities. We want to have vertical <coughs> agriculture. We, have, we want to have buildings to grow plants. We want to have glass in those buildings be photovoltaics. Spray on eventually photovoltaics to make the energy efficient buildings. And we may be able to be much more efficient as human beings in the following way. If you work, bosses of the world, relax, I'm not trying to get rid of you, but if you work for a boss that you don't like, you may not be as efficient. And because of new forms of artificial intelligence, some of those jobs may become obsolete. Increasingly, we'll start to make a living being ourselves. Some of you may have heard of the psychologist Abraham Maslow. Freud studied how you get sick, Maslow studied how you get well. And Maslow said there's a series of steps we go through to become healthy adults. Safety needs, love and belongingness needs, esteem needs, and eventually self-actualization. And we're doing this for civilization as well. Most of the world was in extreme poverty in 1981. Today, with population growth, most of the world is doing quite well in the basic stuff, and only less than 10% of the world is in extreme poverty. That's an extraordinary change. Which means to me that the basic needs of civilization are slowly moving up the hierarchy of Maslow. That we will move towards self-actualization. If all of us are making a living doing what we love, what fulfills us, we'll be better players in the world. Think of how much nonsense people spend arguing with each other because they're arguing over the same thing. But I can't be as good as you as you are. Right? And I never run out of myself. So my self-actualization does not have to compete and destroy you at the same time. So with AI avatars running around the internet, finding what's cool to do, each day I can start to reinvent myself. But that's not going to happen tomorrow morning, but that's the direction of civilization that will address some of these things. Now, it's important to remember that when you hear somebody say, well, that's not possible, I want you to take a pause and consider the following. We've all heard of Moore's Law, computers get cheaper, faster, and uh, Nelson's Law, the pipeline of the internet gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so it goes faster and more goes through it all the time, faster and faster. Anything connected to computers, the Internet of Things, any of these things, they all go faster altogether, right? That makes a lot of change all by itself. But add to that artificial intelligence, going from narrow intelligence like we have today to general intelligence, which we may not have tomorrow, but that looks like it's a direction. But that makes a lot of change as well. Add to that computational science. Computational science Computational physics, computational chemistry, computational engineering means that you do a simulation of the experiment rather than building a laboratory. As we learn how to do that and hook up a lot of computers, we will be able to speed up scientific inquiry far, far faster than people are willing to believe today. As we improve our scientific insight, we improve the technology we can apply. As we improve the technology we apply, we can address climate change much, much more efficiently. But to add to that, synergies among NT. NT is a shorthand way of saying 3D printer, synthetic biology, nanotechnology, there's a whole lot of stuff coming up. So just like we say ICT, for information communication technology, which means software, hardware, all that sort of stuff together, NT. But the thing about NT is the synergies among these things, like your cell phone, integrates a lot of technology. We will do integration of NT, which means that the capabilities of things will be far faster than people think. So you take those four things together, and they change what people will think is possible. That's important, because if somebody tells you X is not important, consider these factors. Who would have believed 50 years ago that Korea 
would outcompete the United States in steel, ships, telecommunications. Huh? Right? You did. Who would believe that? Then. The ability to be surprised will increase, not decrease, because of all of these things. So remember, when someone says these things can't be done, the answer is yes, they can. Is what the Secretary General says, it's for us. The ability to address climate change has been there for years. We know about carbon tax. We know about cap and trade. We know about super synthetic substitute. We know a lot of these things. What we don't know is the coherence of decision. So I hope that the Secretary General and others in the UN will create some sort of collective intelligence system so we get all the answers on the table together. And if you like that answer, you do that answer. And you like that answer, you do that answer. Don't argue. We gotta do it all. Get it all on the table. Create a collective intelligence. Make it available to all the world. So we put together uh, an integrated global strategy. Uh, I won't go through the whole thing. Uh, how are we doing on time? I gotta do this fast. Anyways, PowerPoint will be available to people. One of the, what we did is we've been studying the future for a lot of years. And we integrated those things that address more other things to get the high impact strategies. And these are the high impact strategies from our 25 years plus global research. One of them I will point out, and that is the US China goal of 350 parts per million. When somebody tells you, well, wait a minute, the agreement is 450, that's a political agreement, it's not nature's agreement. Nature doesn't give a damn about physical, about political feasibility, right? So we want to go to 350. Now, if the United States doesn't do it, then throw in the European Union here, right? Uh, but also, cities are where the action is in my country. The federal government is not doing well, but a lot of the cities are addressing these things faster. So anyway, we need an Apollo-like goal, like land a man on the moon. We need some sort of a 350 parts per million by some date or something. We need a serious goal like that. And when somebody says, well, that's not, feasible, that's not feasible, human change is what's the edge. It's not the technological change. We've got the technology. We even have those laws. There's all kinds of stuff we have. We don't have the human action yet. So with that, the future's in our hands. And if anybody wants more information on this, they can see here. And I will now uh, introduce the panel. Please come up. Deep. 
We also use a third of the land surface, and in that I do include Antarctica for our own use, whether it is actually living or whether this is our actual agriculture. And if that doesn't actually shock you, one of the facts that should shock you to show you how much humanity has taken over this planet is the weight of land mammals. We take those and we weigh everything on the planet, 30% is made up of humans, 67% is our livestock and our pets, and only 3% is those wild animals that the BBC and other TV companies run around the world trying to fill to afford your entertainment. That's how much we've changed the planet. So add to that, we have climate change. Now climate change is straightforward physics. So we have the sun, the sun's energy is mainly in the light uh, uh, radiation, it comes through the atmosphere. The atmosphere does not see it, and about a third of it is reflected straight into space. But two thirds is absorbed by the earth. And if you can imagine yourself not here, but on a beautiful tropical island beach, sunning yourself, what happens is you suddenly feel hot, because that's the light energy hitting your skin, converting to heat, and you're radiating that heat back out. And that's exactly what the Earth does. However, the greenhouse gases trap a little bit of that heat, hold it for a little while, and then release it. This is a blanket around the Earth. And firstly, it's a very good blanket. If you take out all the greenhouse gases, which are water vapor, CO2, methane, nitrous oxides, and CFCs, in order of importance, what happens is that the temperature of the planet would drop by 35 degrees Celsius. So that would mean an average summer here would be about minus uh, 25, uh, sorry, minus 15, and a winter would be about minus 35. So greenhouse gases are good. Unfortunately, because of industrialization and because of deforestation and land use changes, we've been putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. If we have a little more of a curve, you can see that it's gone up every single year. We've now increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by about 45% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It's the highest point for at least 3 million years, and we're continuing to do it. So the evidence of that impact, as we can see from sea ice here, um, sea ice has changed markedly over the last uh, 30 years. We have satellite data from 1979 that shows how much that shrunk. It shrunk by about 40% in the worst summer, which was 2018. Sea level change. Sea level change has changed by about 25 centimetres since the 1880s. And the interesting thing is the majority of that up to now has been thermal expansion. The heating up the oceans has allowed them to expand and therefore change the actual sea level. Now, of course, we're seeing melting of Greenland, and this summer, Greenland melted so much that it added about two millimeters to global sea level. You think about that, sea covers 70% of the Earth's surface, so that two millimeters is a huge amount of ice. And then we go to temperature. As you can see, this is the temperatures since the 1880s. And again, I'm showing you three different data sets. One from NASA, the Met Office in the UK, NOAA. And because it is about the weight of evidence, looking at everyone's evidence and showing it. And also at the bottom, this is Ed Hawking's fantastic work about how to represent data to people and the public. And this is his warming stripes. And as you can see, each year, globally, it's represented by a different colour, showing the warming. And 2016 will be the warmest year on record. 2000, this year will be possibly the joint second warmest. We'll find out definitely by January. Of course, what Ed's also done is allowed you to have open source material, so you can actually download these stripes for any country in the world, and you can also have the open R script, so you can actually do it for your own city as well. So this is South Korea, as you can see, the massive warming that's occurred. Now, of course, I'm being a businessman as well, you can also make beautiful ties out of this. 
If you have a Tesla, you can put it on a Tesla. Of course, you can do t-shirts, and of course, you can do leggings as well, as long as they're sustainable cotton, okay? So, what about the future? The future is about us understanding the supercomputers and how they interpret climate data. Now, the interesting thing is the actual science is really solid. We understand thermal mechanics, we understand dynamics of heat exchange. What is interesting is the biggest problem, and I'm going to do this, is you lot. We do not know, hey, how many people will be on the planet by the end of the century? How much carbon will they emit? And therefore, what we do is we start to tell scenarios or stories. And this can be represented by these different future pathways. So as you can see in the red, we have no climate policies, uh, the sort of Donald Trump approach to climate change. We also then have current policies in blue. Now that's only if the current policies are 100% efficient. Now many of you who work in governments know that policies, however well thought out, are rarely more than about 80% efficient. And that gets us to about three to three and a half degrees warming by the end of the century on top of the one degree that we've already warmed. Now again, there are other pathways whereby you can go to two degrees or one and a half degrees, which Bank of was talking about, and those are the ones where we need to change the way we think about our economy and our society to be able to do that. So what are the climate impacts on South Korea? Well firstly, hotter, wetter summers, warmer winters, more seasonal variations. Each season is going to be more variable and less predictable. You're going to have more frequent heat waves. Increase of tropical nights. And again, that is one of the major health risks because it's nighttime temperatures which cause problems particularly with the elderly. We have increased heavy rain events, stronger, more intense typhoons, and increased flooding. And all of those, of course, will impact on agriculture. To give you an example of the changes that occurred over the first past 30 or 40 years, on the left is the summer of 1976. The reason I put this up is because in the United Kingdom where I'm from, 76 is always thought of as this heat wave that actually was uh, terrible. And it's in the actual cultural imprint. But as you can see, it was a small heat wave in Northern Europe and nowhere else, compared with the global heat wave of 2018. What impact will this have? Well, already we're seeing changes in labour capacity. Again, the ability to work outside in the tropics and subtropics is absolutely essential, both for building work and, of course, for agriculture. And this is from the latest Lancet report that was published last, uh, last week by myself and a hundred other colleagues, where we looked at all the different health impacts. And as you can see, Korea is up there uh, having lost a large amount of daily work. So, Ban Ki-moon mentioned the Paris Agreement, which is an incredible international agreement to actually get everybody to try to get to net zero during the 21st century. But the key thing is, this will actually require the transformation of the energy generation, industry, infrastructure, and personal behaviours. I don't think people understand the revolution that we require. The fourth industrial revolution is absolutely essential, and this is why. So if we look at the increase in CO2 emissions, historically that's the red line going up to the top, and as you see, we then have these scenarios. If you want to keep climate change to one and a half degrees, we have to follow those pathways down. And one of the key things is every country in the world needs to be carbon zero by 2050. That's only in 30 years time we have to admit no carbon dioxide. And it actually gets worse, because that's the bit that the politicians would tell you, but what the scientists will also tell you is, depending on how quickly we do that, will depend on how much we have to suck out of the atmosphere in the rest of the century. So not only do we have to get to zero carbon by 2050, we then have to, for the rest of the century, have negative carbon emissions. And that's the big red triangle. So the quicker we go down to zero, the less we'll have to suck out at the end of the century. 
So where this South Korea sit? South Korea is 2% of the global emissions, which is about the same as the United Kingdom. And the interesting thing, though, is that the emissions per person is about 12 tons of CO2 per person, which is twice the amount as the EU, but you'll be pleased to know you're still lower than the United States. <laughs> However, think about it. That has to be zero in 30 years' time. So what we need is win-win solutions. And again, I'm going to make some recommendations which can be used for governments, but even also used for companies, and then I'm going to talk about individual behavior. So possible government actions to get to carbon zero. <coughs> so the first one is to support renewable energy, tax fossil fuels, and cut fossil fuel subsidies. Now, the interesting thing is the smart money, if you really want to make money in this world, is in renewable energy. 45% of growth in electricity generation last year was in renewables. Most of it in wind and solar. The interesting thing from this graph is, of course, Europe, the United States and China have gone huge on renewables. But what's interesting is that Southern and Southeast Asia are lagging behind with the bottom curves. So there's a lot of work to be done there in Southeast Asia. Of course, reforesting and rewilding is essential for those negative emotion, uh, negative, I love that, negative emotion, and negative emissions. We need to promote low emissions farming and diet, support electric cars and public transport, and think about carbon neutral buildings and how to retrofit. Now, the Korean government has been incredibly good about supporting leading technologies. As you see, they've pledged $3.9 billion of investment in new technology next year. And the interesting thing is it is in things like new energy, electric vehicles, smart factories, smart farms, and smart cities, which is absolutely fantastic. However, it sounds a large number until you realize that in 2018, the GDP of South Korea was 1.7 trillion. You want to put that on parity, that's about 2.2 trillion dollars. And again, why do you want to invest in the green economy? Because it's absolutely huge. So this is work I've done. So this unfortunately is data only from 2016. The global economy, for, uh, the global green economy in 2016 was 7.8 trillion dollars. South Korea, its sales were worth $135 billion and employed 835,000 people. And as you can see from this wonderful wheel diagram, we did a lot of analysis on trade flows between uh, South Korea and other countries to see where the actual technology for green economy is going. Again, I apologize only up to 2016. If you would like data for 2017, 2018, and 2019, if you'd like to fund us, we can actually produce that data for all the countries in the world. You know, you have to have a bit of data. Right. Okay. Support and expand the emission trading scheme. Again, South Korea is leading the way with carbon pricing, and again, carbon instruments in 2019 cover about only 13% of global emissions. However, the price for carbon was about 13% higher than 2018. Remember, we need to have a system of monetizing carbon to reduce its impact. So every time I give this talk on climate change, people always ask me, what about people? What can I do as individuals? Well, as CEOs, you can actually do a lot of work. As individuals, you can also change your lifestyle. So the first thing is, I'm going to actually pick on what Ban Ki-moon said and actually repeat what Greta said. Talk about it to everyone. Okay? Climate change is something that is important to everyone and to the next generation. You need to actually talk about it, understand it as a critical issue, and actually work out how you can deal with it. One of the things is switching to a more vegetarian or vegan diet. In the UK, if you actually switch from a normal English diet to a vegetarian diet, you half the carbon from your food. If you can go vegan, you drop it down to about a third. Switch to a renewable energy supplier. Okay? The interesting thing is in London, all the boroughs are getting together. They cover 8 million people. 
They're working together and they are going to go to the energy companies and as a block say, we are buying electricity, but it all has to be renewable. Imagine if Seoul as a city said, right, we're only having a, a renewable electricity, who's going to actually sell it to us? 